that night, got a phone call from Mr. Henry. He said, I'm tired of Earnhardt wrecking my cars. If you can't do something about it, I'll get somebody in there that will. Mm. <laughs> what are you going to do, Boy. Kenny? You're going to do something about it, right? Where's your yeah. check come from, <laughs> right? It's the Kenny Wallace Conversation brought to you by Jags. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation brought to you by Jags, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jegs.com for everything and anything you need to fix your cars up. Today is really exciting for me, and here's why. Because in 1984, I was a NASCAR Winston Cup crew chief. And all along, I was watching this man, a hero, a NASCAR great. I was watching him win races. As I was a crew chief, the great Jeff Bodine. Jeff, how are you doing? Well, I don't use that word great. I'm just, I'm just a guy, you know, not racing anymore. So I'm just a fan, I guess you could say. But, you know, Jackson's a great company. And Jake actually drove our bobsleds up in Lake Placid in some of our races. So, uh, yeah, he's a great friend. And they sponsored us a little bit, too. Great company, great products. Uh, go to Jake's. You need yeah. something for your car. Yeah, the Coffin family, they're wonderful people. And, and they're definitely winners. Well, let's have a little fun first, okay? We're, before we dive into your incredible life, your incredible career, I, you know, the Hermanator, which is me, I'm a little lighthearted at times. So really? your name... Well, you know, we have a good time. That 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 name, Jeff, I like that spelling, G-E-O-F-F. -F. Tell me about that. How did mom and dad pick that spelling out instead of the famous J-E-F-F? -F? I guess they knew I was going to be different, so they spell it differently. You know, it's, it's Jeffrey Chaucer, the old writer, and that <laughs> spelling is becoming popular now, but... Yeah, through the years, uh, Kenny, I've been called G-Off, Godfrey, you name it. I've been called plus some other names I can't say. But, yeah, it was it was a little difficult growing up because people didn't know how to say it, didn't know what it meant. But uh, it's okay now. That's but the, You know, I changed my name to Jeffrey in racing. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, well, the reason why, of course, it's in a book, I think. Uh, Jeff Gordon came along, Jeff Green, Jeff Burton. And I'd be walking down pit road to get my car. I hear Jeff. I turn around. They didn't want me. They wanted one of those other Jeffs. I said, I can fix that. I was <laughs> the Jeffrey. It was a little PR deal, but it worked. If they didn't say Jeffrey, I didn't turn around. Yeah, I totally get it. Well, as we get going here, uh, this is a really big day for you, a really big week for you. Um, you are a Daytona 500 champion, and we are going to get to that. But... This is why it's a big day for you. You got a really big book coming out, all of it, Jeff Bodine. And uh, I know that I just got done talking to the president of the Daytona Speedway. He came out to watch me race, and he told me that they are going to have a really nice area set up for you during the Daytona 500 Speed Weeks to sign this book. Uh, tell me a little bit about your book, and then we'll get into some of the, uh, the parts of the book. Yeah, uh, actually, we were at New Smyrna the other night when they had the modified 200 lap race, and uh, a lot of people from up north were down. It's really great talking to all them, and they bought a lot of books, and of course, I autographed them for them. But we are going to be in Daytona uh, Saturday and Sunday, and it's out in the uh, uh, in front of the track where they have souvenirs and all that. The Midway. Stuff. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> So everyone, everyone come on by uh, a lot of time when you're getting into the track and leaving, uh, but we'll be there and, uh, having fun signing some books. So I'm going to read something that is my favorite part. And I had people all over social media. This is the number one question. Now, look, you've done it all. We get that. And I'm going to read your stats out in a little bit. You've done it all. And I'm going to remind people what you've done. But let me read this part in the book, and then I want you to respond. You said the, um, that you wanted to race in the Powder Puff Derby. So we know that's about ladies. Only ladies run in the Powder Puff Derby. A friend of mine, Mike Casterling, 
who happened to be my cousin, Pam's boyfriend, had a late model car. I asked him if I could drive his car in the powder puff. He looked at me, are you crazy? And you said, I just want to race. I told him, but I can't until I'm 18 and graduate. So I'm not going to keep on going, but I guess you an entered the powder puff race. Tell me about this moment in this incredible book that set you off on your racing path. Yeah, well, that's all in there. But actually, I saw Mike at New Smyrna the other night. <laughs> I said, you know, you're in a book. He said, wow, oh, that, that's awesome. But no, my parents wouldn't let me race. And uh, it was a dirt track uh, until I was 18 and graduated. But, man, I knew I could race. A friend came to test one day. I used to open the track up if somebody wanted to test. And he let me drive his car. And I went around and around. It had a small gas tank. And they kept waving me to come in. But finally, granted, I guess, and I had to come in. But, I mean, I loved it, and I knew I could drive. I had an uncle that was a great driver, and I just watched him all the time. And so, yeah, I came up with this idea. My dad would promote a powder puff derby once a month through the season. And I said, man, I want to I want to show people. Well, I want to prove to myself I can drive because I didn't tell my parents that I was going to do it, obviously. And I'm out there, started last. They were making a lap, and we just drove on the track behind everybody, and I'm sure they wondered who was driving the 588, but it didn't matter. Just another car. Got the lead. And, man, it was fun. I just. <laughs> it was natural that I, to do it. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't scared or intimidated. But now it's coming to the end of the race. And my dad always gave the winner a hug, a kiss, and a trophy. I said, hell, I can't. I can't win this race. What am I going to do? And I said, well, I could either win it and get in a lot of trouble with my parents or pull off and just not even tell anybody I did it. So that's what I did. I turned the car off, coasted off like the engine broke. My parents didn't know I had done that until their 50th wedding anniversary. My brother, Brett, got up in front of him and said, hey, Ma, I got something to tell you. Told the story. My mother pointed her finger and shook it. Jeffrey, you shouldn't have done it. I said, Ma, that was a long time ago. You shouldn't have done it. But I did. <laughs> I, I, now I look back, I wish I'd finished the race and won and seen the look on my father's face when he went to kiss me. That was it. I, I wore, you know, back then we had small helmets. So I yeah. borrowed a wig from my cousin, Pam. So the hair was hanging down and small helmet. Uh, it would have been cool to win, but back then I was pretty scared of doing that face of my parents after that. And, and, and that is more of the story. You actually had a, a wig on. And yeah. uh, John, John Biskey, who is from the Northeast, he works here at the Worldwide Technology Raceway for the NASCAR Cup races. And John said he, he put it on social media. And, uh, man, what a story. You know, I tell kids nowadays, I say, we do what it takes, you know, to fulfill your dream. And that's, hey, you dressed, you got in the powder puff race and, and you fulfilled your dream. Well, I, I proved I could drive, you know. And, uh, yeah. Well, I bet my dad had a, they had a small track inside for kids. When I started when I was five, he built me a little micro midget, they call it. And uh, so before the main races, we'd go out to <laughs> race. And, you know, I won a few of those races. And, you know, that was boring to me. I, a year old when they started racing, I was at the tracks. So I said, just a little baby and it's in my blood you know the lord gave me the right parents the right opportunities and da, 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 it's all in a book and uh, so i thank him for everything because i'm just a farm kid from Chemung, new york so allow me to brag on you for a while this is where my big brother rusty wallace his most famous quote in the last 10 years he said it's sad to say but you have to remind people because People remember what they want to, Jeff. So I'm going to read you all this, and then I want you to respond. And we're going to do this nice and slow. Um, you know, we're going to yeah, get along for a while. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. I, I know all that. Hey, and we can talk about that. But you know, when we were in Darlington for the 75th greatest drivers thing, and yes. all the drivers that are still alive are there. And Rusty, I, it was so much fun talking to everybody because we're not in competition anymore. We're not beating each other up. We're not mad at each other. 
we were talking about kids, about jobs, about what are you doing today. And so nice to be able to do that. But uh, we, when we were racing, we weren't real buddies. <laughs> so we'll go ahead right now and we'll call the audible. We're, okay. we're going we're, we're gonna to call an audible and I'm going to talk. Let's talk about that right now. So in 1984, I was not even a race car driver. And I came down and I ended up being, I took over the great Jake Elder's crew chief job when Joe Rutman was driving the Levi Garrett car. Okay. So I'm a cup crew chief in 1984 for Joe Rutman. And when my job was done there, your crew chief, your owner, Harry Hyde, called me up. And he says, uh, I'd like you to come over and work on our team in 1985. So I get over there. And my interview in 1985 to work on your team doesn't go good because you and my big brother, Rusty Wallace, got into a pissing match at Darlington. And it, it was a big wreck. So because of you and Rusty wrecking each other, Harry Hyde would not hire me because Rusty's brother, Kenny, I could not work for you. Now, let's have a little fun and let's stay lighthearted. Don't get, don't get mad. What's your what's your point of view? Why didn't you why did you and Rusty get into it? Rusty says it was Darlington. Uh, you know, <laughs> Let's have fun now. Don't get mad. I, I think I've hit more walls in my career than you have, thank goodness for you. And I am older than you, and I can't remember as much as you probably. So Okay, you know, that's I don't fair. Remember what, uh, what happened at Darlington? I really don't. You know, Rusty and I, uh, the, the thing I remember about Rusty was at Richmond, mm. the new track. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's the one I remember. Uh, after that, he, he named me uh, a dunce for the Conehead mm. or no Conehead. Okay. And no, we were, before Hoosier got into it, we ran Hoosier Tires because they were fast, especially on a short track. So in, oh, yeah. in Richmond, we qualified on them. Well, they were okay for two laps. I put them out for practice, went out about 10 laps. They were tore up, blistered, and the rubber was flying all over the place. So NASCAR said, all right, you guys can switch to good years, but you're going to have to start last. And Rusty mm -hmm. was, did the same thing I did. He qualified on uh, Hoosiers. So here we are in the back, and I don't know who else was there. And here we come for the start down the front straight race curve, as we, you know. And I was inside of Rusty, and – he says I came up on him, and I say, Rusty, you just turned on me. He ran over my hood and yeah. we wrecked, right at the start. So he, he called me a conehead. Of course, Earnhardt named him Rubberhead, and Earnhardt was hardhead. We liked to name each other back in those days. There were great that, nicknames. To me, that was when the feud or whatever started right there at that race. I'm, I'm not sure about Darlington. I'll have to ask Rusty, Rusty the next time I see him. I don't want to get too deep into our conversation because uh, with, without saying all this, let's, let's come back to that. So here we go. Uh, this is going to really make you happy. Okay. <laughs> Jeff Bodine, 74 years old. Are you 75 yet? April 18th. Okay. So you're 70. You can send presents April 18th. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Presents. The great Jeff Bodine, 74 years old. And by the way, I just got done doing a Kenny conversation with 74-year-old John Force, and he's still winning. Mm -hmm. So stay walking, eat your grilled chicken, because you look good. You look really good right now, Jeff. Um, yeah, sure. All right, here we go. You did it all in Asphalt Modifieds. You and Richie Evans, you're the kings. There's nobody better than you. Uh, you and Richie Evans, there's too many stats, Jeff, to name about the Modifieds, but I will say this. You are in the Guinness Book of World Records right now because you won 55 wins in one year. Uh, and like I said, I know Richie Evans is the man. I get that. But you were incredible. And uh, your time in the Northeast is what sent you down to NASCAR. All right, now let's let's move on to NASCAR. I've done told everybody that I think you're the greatest. 
right there with Richie Evans, 55 wins in one year, Guinness Book of World Records. And that's a tough series. All right. Once you get the NASCAR, it's unbelievable. You become the 1986 Daytona 500 champion. Our, our greatest race of all time, you win it. You got nine, you got 18, 18 NASCAR Cup wins. You are the 1987 IROC champion. That is against the greatest. In 1987, you beat all the greats in the world. 1987 IROC champion. 1994 Winston Select winner. 1992 Bush Clash winner. And I could keep going, but let's end it like this. Named one of NASCAR's 50 greats. Now, there's been thousands and thousands and thousands of drivers. And you're, and you're named one of the 50 greats. Now, when I tell you all that, tell me what goes through your mind. That's easy. I'm just fortunate. I'm a fortunate man to have all those opportunities to do those things. And, and I was given talent to build cars, design cars. I've done that all my life. I'm still doing it actually. And, uh, God gave me some talents to drive, obviously, but I, I, I give all the credit that I always build a better car than the other guys. And I, I was ahead of them in, in that respect. Uh, and I didn't run for championship back in the modified days. Richie and Jerry Cook did, so they all won all the championship. I had to go where the money was because I had a family. I had to pay for the bills and the diapers and all that stuff. So we concentrated on just the big races and uh, not championships. But just a fortunate guy, Kenny. I mean, it's just un it's an unbelievable that all this has happened to a kid that grew up on a chicken farm, dairy farm up in Shimong, New York. It really is. So, so that is in one of my questions. Uh, we're, we're down here in Missouri and we have fenders on our cars and the great Larry Phillips, Richie Evans. We thought of those guys back in the late seventies. It's like, how is Richie Evans? How is Larry Phillips racing for a living when you're not supposed to? So th this is in one of my questions to you. Were, were you racing for money, a living, or was it a hobby back then? Oh, no. No, since the, I started racing on my father's track. Shimon. I graduated and it was oh. 18, and that's how I made a living. I went to Unbelievable. College. I went to college six years in the National Guard, but I, I was able to race all through that. And... Uh, uh, you know, I didn't, I tried to work, have another job. I worked at Stroman. We all company. did. <laughs> I worked at Stroman's Bread Factory in Sarah, Pennsylvania. That lasted about three weeks because, man, they called me up about 2.33 in the morning. Hey, come on in here. We got to make, we're making bread. Uh, I don't eat bread today. The smell of bread at 3.30 in the morning just turned me right off. But Right. So I, I tried other things, but no, I always raced and was able to make a living, pay for college and, of course, got married and kept moving up and racing. And, you know, they paid almost as much back in those days as they paid today to win a short track race. It's sad because it yeah. costs a lot more to race today. But I was able to survive and make a living just racing, yeah. So can I see your ring? Can you put your, your ring on your finger? What is that ring? This ring is the uh, gold medal ring from the Olympics. Our, oh our my gosh. Box beds and our team Holcomb won the four man race in Vancouver in the Olympics. Winning a four man race is like winning Daytona, the biggest, yes. baddest race going. Of course, this this little ring is the Daytona 500 ring back in 1986. Man, I almost won it again in 2002. But today's Daytona rings are bigger, as big or bigger than this one. But And I'm not bragging about this. this no, you should bad. brag. Remind us. No. I'm the only guy in the whole world that has one of each. And I don't think that will ever be matched because who is going to build bobsleds that wins a Daytona 500? I mean, that's – I'm not building them now, unfortunately, but uh, that was a great run we had with those bobsleds. 
Okay, let's let's not get out of line. We're going to go back to the Bodine bobsled. What an unbelievably passionate American story. So what I want to talk to you about is your engineering background. You know, Ryan Newman, you know, Purdue University. But in 1984, when I was a crew chief, what I remember about you was you were so smart and you were innovative and that was just the Northeast. You know, Cheech came down and was building spindles. We had this, we had this influx of Northeastern smarts. you way smarter than us Southern guys. We could okay. just, we, we just used a welder and we could cheat. <laughs> well, I'm a Midwest boy, but tell me where your incredible engineering background, where did that come from? I had uncles, three of them. Maynard Earl, yeah. and Jimmy. Yeah. Maynard was a smart guy. He built engines and he showed me how to build engines. I started out just cleaning parts, sweeping the floor. Maynard Troyer? No, Maynard Bodine. Okay. Three okay. Yeah. And Earl was a great driver. And just by watching him, I knew how to drive. And my Uncle Jimmy was, he did it all. He tried driving, that didn't work, but he was a mechanic and engine builder. So I had three people uh, educate me through my younger days to uh, how to build race cars and maintain them. And that's where it all started. I went to college for mechanical engineering to learn more about how to build things and all that. And one day the professor, I asked him a question and he said, I don't know what answer that, Jeff. He was a German, great uh, professor. And so I said, mm, he can't answer my question. I guess I don't need to be here anymore. So I wow. stopped going to college. But then I was in the National Guard Went through basic training, all that, and I learned about trucks and equipment, how to maintain them and change the oil, but the electrical system. So that actually helped me a little bit in racing. Yeah, but well, I give I give all the credit to the Lord above because he he put all that in me, and uh, yeah. we, he he does that. He has a plan for everybody in life. Sometimes yeah. you miss the plan. A lot of people do, unfortunately. You you made the plan. Your brother yeah. Ernard, yeah. everyone seemed to go where they were the plan was for their lives and uh yeah i did too i was just very fortunate that i had the education he led me to the right people at the right time did the right things i take credit for all the mistakes i made made in my career but i give him all the credit for the good stuff well that that's why we go to confession none of us are perfect and uh we all have a journey we can clean our sins and move right on so buddy you just keep on digging. I love you. You're a great man. You've done a lot in the past. So we all make we all run into a wall every once in a while, but that's okay. Yeah. It's what you do after. And uh that's and up. you're kicking ass right now. So you just keep doing that. Um so I want to have a little fun with you, okay? And this is lighthearted. So, you know, the Civil War was not lighthearted, it, it was it was hardcore. Mm -hmm. But you know, you were a Yankee and uh a Yankee meant you were from New York, specifically Shemong is the name we remember. Uh, right. I'm sure there's other little New York towns you were from, but Shemong is what you made famous. But what is interesting to me is you were a Yankee. It was the North versus the South. And then listen, in 1984, the Civil War was still going on quietly. Mm -hmm. And you come down to NASCAR and a, and a, a Southerner, hires you, the great Rick Hendrick. That really had to confuse all, all the Southerners. Tell me about, you know, just being a Yankee and, and this unbelievable man, Rick Hendrick, who is now one of the greatest of all time, hires you. Tell me about this time going to Hendrick and being a Yankee. You know, what really surprised me and my whole family uh, about moving south. <laughs> well, in the Northeast, they didn't like me. They booed me. When I went, I'd get on the microphone. I said, I, I love you guys booing. That's boo power. Boo louder. And they boo louder. I said, well, I'm going faster next week. <laughs> with, with the race fans. And, uh, but when I came south, now I'm expecting the same thing. You know, I went into the late model series, which is Xfinity now. Right. And uh, you know what? Just the opposite. They love me because I came down here and beat some of their villain drivers. Yeah. Like Tommy Ellis 
Uh, a lot of people love Sam Ard, but he won too much. Jack Ingram, Sonny Hutchin. So we couldn't believe the, the friendship when we came here and they liked me. I said, it was great. Nobody's booing me much. Well, after I started winning, they started booing a little bit. But then, <laughs> yeah. but then uh, when Rick called me up, actually, he didn't call me up. It was Harry Hyde called me up. You know, I, I raced for Dick Bear uh, a couple races in Cup. I raced for uh, uh, Bob, uh, or, yeah, the BD team, the Race Hill Farms team, 47 car. That wow, lasted three yeah. So, so I met Harry Hyde, uh, the Wood Bullet brothers, I mean, Leonard Wood, all those people. And so I knew a little bit about racing and, and exposed to it. But Harry Hyde called me up and uh, he said, hey, and he, he, they'd already talked to Richard Petty about driving and Tim Richmond. Now, this wow. is a great story. It's in a book. But here I come. To, he said, I got to I got We're, we're going to form a race team in this car together down here in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's putting it together. And he's a, he's a great guy and he'll produce more than he ever promises. So come on down. We want to talk. So went to City Chevrolet, went to the office. We talked. And actually, Rick used to hang out with Ray Hendrick and Jack Tant. Wow. Rides. Oh, yeah. He's the number a- one. He went around and he saw me race when we raced against Jack and, and Ray Henry. And was, so he knew me more than I knew him. So anyway, we chatted and uh, he said, you know, I can only really promise you about 15 races. You know, we'll have to see how it goes. That's kind of the money we got laid out to, to, uh, to sponsor this team. Yeah. And so, uh, okay, I like that. Now, I had a full ride with Cliff Stewart. The full season. The Gatorade but, car, right? Yeah, we ended up with Gatorade. But uh, I want, when Harry Hyde was in that room, he's the guy I wanted to be with. It wasn't yeah. Rick. Now, he knows this story. It wasn't Rick. I didn't know him. Harry was the guy I wanted to be with because he was a winning crew chief. And I said, he can show me how to win. So I, uh, they said, okay, we'll, uh, Rick said, let Harry and I talk about it. We'll give you a call. Well, of course, back in those days, they didn't have these things. Right. The landline. Right. right. How many calls that you were supposed to get on your landline never happened? So oh. I said, uh, <laughs> so I said, well, Rick, you mind if I just wait out in the waiting room at the dealership? Yeah. He said, yeah, of course. But that impressed him so much that they called Tim up, said, Tim, we got us a driver. You're too mm-hmm. late. And five minutes later, came out, got me, shook my hand, said, you're the driver. But if I hadn't waited in the lobby, that might not have happened. So uh, I call that a God thing. You know, yeah. I mean, still, he said, he, something went in my brain that uh, don't drive home without an answer. You might not ever get the right answer. Wow. So that's a cool thing. But, but Rick had been watching me all these years in Modified because he was a Modified fan. It's pretty amazing. So – you are a major part of the Hendrick story. You know, like right now we hear Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, and they're great. They're incredibly good. But to this day, Rick Hendrick gives you all the credit for creating Hendrick Motorsport because he says, Rick Hendrick says, that if you did not win that race at Martinsville, the big cup race, the 500 lap cup race, he felt like they were done. Because they couldn't have, it couldn't keep going, and Rick Hendrick says because you won the 500 lap NASCAR Cup race with Harry Hyde, that you Jeff Bodine, the Yankee, you're the one that created and helped Hendrick Motorsport what it is today. How, how does that make you feel when Rick Hendrick brags on you that much? Well, the first seven races we had some good runs, but we had some not so good runs. And, uh, yeah, Rick came to us, and he was just – I think he had two car dealerships then, just a small car dealer. And he came to Rick Harry, and I said, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Man, I've spent way more money than I thought I was going to have to spend to get this team going, and uh, I'm going to have to shut it down. <laughs> my heart's Oh, my down. gosh, yeah. And uh, so Harry got with him and said, Rick, the car is ready. The engine's in it. Randy Dorton engine. It's in there. You might have to buy a few tires. And he said, you know, Harry Hyde from Kentucky, you know, 
that bolt iron, you wonder if you race it at Martinsville, which I had modifieds and late models. And I'd run there with Cliff Stewart. So uh, he knew my potential, I guess. And Rick said, well, all right, I'll give you one more chance. Now, Rick and his wife, Linda, were in Greensboro at a church conference. So they weren't even at the track. And wow. of course, like I said, we didn't have these things. So after right. we won the race, Rick had to call his mother up, who was home. She said, Ricky, Ricky, they won the race. They won the race. Well, I live right just a little south of Greensboro. So <laughs> Rick and Linda made a stop at a convenience store, bought a bunch of toilet paper. They went to my house and toilet papered the house. His first win in NASCAR, my first win in NASCAR, and I get my house toilet papered. You know, today, when you, if you do that year round, you go to California, you go to New York City, you get on all these TV shows. But that was the celebration. I took my, some of my crew and my family to uh, Clarence's Steakhouse just up the road from. Yes, we all go there. Yeah, well, I see that's still there, but that was our victory celebration. And so uh, a whole lot different in that, but it was amazing. Uh, yeah, it was a dream come true. And uh, they kept the doors open at Henrik Motorsports. And, you know, so the moral of that story is, yeah. is everything you do in life and everything you say eventually can affect your life and millions of other people, thousands of other people. If I had that, that won that race, where would all those people that work for Henrik Motorsports be today? Right. We don't know. We don't know. Where would Jeff Gordon, what was his career be like? What would Jimmy Johnson, all, all those guys, drivers, what would their careers been like? So everything you do and say affects, so be careful. I always try to think before I open my mouth. So Nowadays we do. Yeah. <laughs> so, you never do. <laughs> well, I'm a lover, but I'm also verbally aggressive. Uh, I want, I want to tell you something. Him. I'm a lover. Listen, I want to tell you a story about that win at Martinsville. I was there. And you just said to me that, you know, tires were a big thing, tire money. And Harry Hyde that day, I was watching your pit stops. Now, remember, I'm 60 years old right now. Uh, do you know? I mean, you were sitting in the car, Jeff. And, and they jacked the left sides up. Harry would take your, your left rear tire off, okay? And immediately put it in cool water. And the next pit stop, he'd take that left rear and put it on your left front. I watched it. And he might have saved Rick some money that day. But I found that an engineering move. Because in those days, when your car, that red and white number five, when that car came up off the corner and all of us, you, you, there was a foot underneath the left front. You were carrying that left front. You, you were getting real good grip. So in the day, you'd come up off the corner, left front, just every once in a while, come up off the ground. So the left front wasn't getting any tire wear. But I wanted to tell you my view of your great win that day. I remember Harry swapping those left sides out for that left front. And he probably saved Rick six hundred dollars in that race. Yeah. yeah. You, you do you think you and Harry, even though you all were you and Harry Hyde were a little different, did were you guys ever on the same page, engineering minded? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. The neat thing about that race, Harry picked the first pit coming in on the front side of the pit row. You pick yeah. down in the middle. What happens? You got all bogged down. You get in traffic. You can't go. So he picked the first pit as you exit turn four. That was yeah. genius. That really was. And I asked him, why are you picking that pit? Because we qualified, what, I don't even know, third or fourth. We would be way down there. He said, Bodon, I know what I'm doing. He, he sure did. Because it, we didn't get slowed down when we made a pit stop. Uh, did we uh, get along? Yeah, we got along until I mentioned something to him. You know, his setups were on a three by five, five index card. He had this fine point pen. And this goes back right here. Racing the K and K Dodge and all those years. Bobby they had, Isaac. They had torsion bars in the front of those cars. He had a conversion from that torsion bar to a coil spring. He said, wow. this is what we ran here before. And this is what it is in a coil spring. This is what we need. Well, like I said, I joined the team because I wanted to race with him and, I thought he would show me how to win, which he did. But 
some of those setups didn't work so good on the bigger tracks. Yeah. And the reason why was Terry liked to put a lot of lead in the trunk of the car to make it wave properly. He put it in the trunk behind the axle. And yeah. some tracks that just didn't work. Right. So I said, Harry, I said, Harry, you know, some tracks, this isn't working. You know what that is? You put that lead behind the axle. That's like a pendulum. You know, a pendulum has weight on the bottom. It's, it'll swing the back end out when you go in the corner. He goes, bodine. I don't know anything about no pendulum effect, but that's where the lead's going to go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Boy. Yes, yeah, so that's when we started having, having a little head button thing. And that's why uh, when Tim Richmond came into the, the Henrik Motorsports, Harry went with Tim, and uh, I ended up with uh, Gary Nelson for a while. We went Daytona with Gary. So yeah. uh, we switched around because Harry couldn't understand that pendulum effect. <laughs> yeah, I get it. So, so let's move on a little bit. Let's move on to something that I think made you more famous uh, in, in, a, in a way that the historians will remember. So this movie comes out with Tom Cruise, Days of Thunder. Mm-hmm. And this, this movie to this day is still very successful, like on Netflix or Hulu or anyone. Uh, Days of Thunder really put NASCAR on the map. And there's a part in the movie where NASCAR is really tired of Jeff Bodine and Dale Earnhardt Sr. fighting. You two were going at it. You, you, you had as much car control as the great Dale Sr. did. He would try to wreck you. He couldn't wreck you. Sometimes he did wreck you. NASCAR had enough of it. They brought you down to Daytona. And, of course, the movie Days of Thunder exaggerates it. But in real, tell me about you and Dale Earnhardt Sr., the man in black, number three. Tell me about you two having to go to Daytona. What really happened? <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> I'll tell you everything. It's in the well, book. Give, me, give me some highlights. Just but, some highlights. You know, when, when I got into Cup, Dale yeah. and I were buddies. We go to <laughs> On the Dover, we go out to dinner with Teresa and my wife and have some seafood and just talk. But as soon as you start, I started winning, you know, the friendship went away. And yeah. uh, because he liked to win. Yeah. Oh, well. yeah. But uh, the penalty box, you remember that? Oh, yeah. The penalty box. Well, what it was, Dale had hit me. I'd hit him back. They put me, call me in, and they started the penalty box after me. Park you. Because I said, what? Well, he ran into me. It could have been a mistake, but we know you that hit him on purpose. You're mad. You come in here, calm down. So it didn't take me long to figure out uh, that wasn't a good thing to hit him back after he hit me. And Rick Henrik the same way. And it was at Charlotte for late model race. We were leading Robert G's car. Robert G was the grandfather of Kelly, Dale, and T- uh, Yeah. Yeah. Kids. Yep. I'm leading the race and we didn't pit. Most everyone else did. And so coming going and I knew they were going to pass me because they had new tires. So yeah. Earnhardt gets behind me coming off the turn two, spins me out. And I spun around down in the back stretch, blew the tires out. We changed them, didn't hurt the car. And I went out there and we ran side by side. Everyone knew I was going to wreck him, but I didn't. I ran him out <laughs> of the never touched him. And uh that night got a phone call from Mr. Henry. He said, I'm tired of Earnhardt wrecking my cars. If you can't do something about it, I'll get somebody in there that will. Mm. <laughs> what are you going to oh, do, boy. Kenny? You're going to do something about it, right? Where's now, your check come from, car. right? We had a fast car for the 600, and I'm starting right behind Earnhardt. Perfect, perfect. I'm right behind him. <laughs> he might have been fifth or, or sixth. Or we we're right to the front, and he's loose. He kept waving me to pass him. I kept waving back. Yeah. <laughs> he waved me to pass him. He was loose getting off the corner. He kept, I kept waving at him. And I didn't want to get anyone else involved in this. But, you know, I figured out how the penalty box worked. So I had to hit him first. So yeah, coming off, too, I hit him. Got him sideways. And I pulled up next to him, a little ahead of him, down the back stretch. And uh, I figured he'd just hit me a little bit, pay me back. No, no, he put me in a wall. Oh. Well, they penalized him, what, five or six laps that day. 
And uh, that night, got a call from Mr. Hendrick again. Meet us at the airport. And we all flew down there, and uh, we went in the office, at NASCAR office, and uh, all the officials were lined up at this long table, and Earnhardt and I sat, sat across from each other. Rick and, of course, Richard Childers were there, and Mr. France sat at the head of the table. And back wow. in those days, we didn't have cell phones, all the technology, so there was a pile of VCRs and all this stuff here. He came in and laid this VCR tape down and went, I know we're not going to have to watch this. We're going to work this out as man. So he proceeded to go. <laughs> uh, Dale, what happened on that Saturday race? Billy? I mean, that's that's how we talked to Billy. Billy, you know, the boy didn't pit. We pitted for tires. We had new tires. He didn't. So I caught him. And coming off the two, I was going to go under him. My left front hit the apron. It just shot me up into him. I, you know, I made, I made a mistake. It was my fault. <laughs> I made a mistake. And I'm sitting there. Hmm, it's going to be my turn here in a minute. And he said, well, Dale, what happened? Sunday's race. <laughs> Billy, I know you can't go into turn three underneath somebody. You're going to get loose. Yeah, I knew I knew it, but I made a mistake. I went in there thinking I was going to be all right. And the car got loose, and I'm running into him. <laughs> he said, uh, hmm. So I'm looking over there. I said, Dale, for somebody who's so, supposed to be so damn good, you make a lot of mistakes. Mr. Francis. <laughs> Mr. France, I think we need to look at the video. He showed the Saturday race. Dale just run in there. Boom. He kept replaying. Boom. Boom. Dale, looks like he just ran into the boy. Then he put Sunday in there. And he said, and he kept showing it over and over again. He said, Dale, looks like he didn't turn the steering wheel going into turn three. He said, I'm going to tell you boys how you're going to do it. And that's the rest of the story. I'm not going to tell the rest. Yeah, yeah. Stop <laughs> right there. But that that's the... Uh, uh, the beginning of the friendship between Dale and France, uh, France Jr. He, he knew he had to be his friend because he's yeah. the boss. He told us he was the boss. He yeah. said, you're effing with the way I make my living, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to race. Yeah. So Dale became his friend and uh, got away with a lot of stuff, and I'm just the old dumb Yankee. I just figured, well, I'll go out there and win and earn what I get. I didn't yep. become friends, so anyway, the rest of the story, all the details are in the book. It's really funny, and uh, no one knows it but a few people. Well, listen, people they find a book now. it was a hell of a show. I mean, yeah. it, it, it was a hell of a show, and it's all in there. So, Jeff, can you believe when we have fun doing Kenny conversation, the time flies? Now, we're not done, but we're at 45 minutes, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up with – uh, basically my, one of my favorite stories about you. Now, listen, I admire you for what you've done. You're an incredible race car driver, but let's, let's get to something that, that you, you made America great again. Uh, 1992, you're watching the Olympics and you cannot believe how bad our bobsled team is. Um, now, I'm not, I don't want to steal your thunder, because I know the whole story, but I, but I started the story for you. In 1992, you're like, why are we so bad? Why don't we win at bobsleds? So the Olympics represent in America. So what do you do? Well, the announcer, John Morgan, uh, who was part of our project and is a great friend of ours still, he made the statement, well, maybe why the Americans aren't doing well is they have to buy and use European equipment. Wow. So wait a minute. Americans representing the United States of America in the worldwide Olympics, they're not using American made equipment. And so I investigated that and sure enough they weren't. And a friend of mine threw, flew us up to Lake Placid uh, right after that. The track was still open and it was right after Rockingham and uh, they gave me a ride. Scared the life out of me. The old track it dangerous. Fast. And, uh, then the kids said, hey, you want to drive? I said, I'll kill us. No. We, we, <laughs> we only went part way up. The first time down, man, I did good. And you know what happens when a race driver does good. Your head gets this big. I you said, want I, to want do to, I want to do this again. And the second time down, I didn't do, do quite so good. 
I came out off the last corner too early and the front hit the wall and the inside wall and the back slammed the wall. Hmm. And the owner of the sled, Bruce Roselli, was riding Brickman with me and knocked the wind out of it. So on ESPN, ESPN was there with their cameras and the recorder had to push, play and record. And they taped the cameras on her head, knocked the wind out of it. And, uh, but anyway, I bent the frame on his sled. Now, at that time of the day, I knew I couldn't be a coach. I couldn't be an athlete. No way. But then I learned, sure enough, these sleds were European. It, and it was junk. Unbelievable. It was terrible. So I knew what I wanted to do by then, but I bent this kid's frame six inches to the left. And I said, well, Bruce, I have, guess I'll have to build you a bob sled. Now, they thought I was going to go fly back down to North Carolina with a nice and warm race and just forget all about it. But, you know, like you, Kenny, when you say something, you're obligated to do it. Yeah, be careful what you say. <laughs> so you got to be careful. But I said it, and, and I said, now what do I do? You know, I'm racing, my crew is racing, but I hired my friends in Connecticut to do the project for me. Now, mm. I funded it and uh, in the beginning, and uh, they ended up building sleds that were the best in the world, the fastest in the world. We actually changed the way sleds are built around the world because we applied NASCAR racing technology to how to build it. The bodies come off so you can work on it. Their sleds, the body didn't come off. They had to cut little holes in it to work on it. So we, oh we made them safer and the whole thing. And uh, so it was a great, a great run. I'm proud of all the French. Cheech was part of it. Cheech Gardy's a was he? fabricator down yeah. south. But yeah, he, he used to work up there with Chassis Dynamics. And a lot of friends and people were behind it. I, I supplied the money and the idea. Yeah. I well, what's up? Because the name is Bodine Chassis. Well, the B-O is me. The hyphen D-Y-N is their company, Chassis Dynamics. We used to build race cars together. We call them Bodine chassis, modified. Yeah. And they're still running out there, winning races. So I'm uh, very proud of that. Uh, but, you know, Kenny, we didn't mention this. You, you brought it up a little bit. I'll be quick. The, you know, the things I'm most proud about in racing isn't the wins. Not at all. It's the safety things that I brought to the sport. The full-face helmet. I brought that to the That sport. was you. Oh, my God. That's another story. Watkins Glen, New York. Power steering, they weren't using power steering. Power steering is, isn't just to make the car steer easier. You can set your front end better to handle better. Now, Earnhardt didn't know that at the time. He said, I'll never have power steering. I said, yes, you will. I will not. Just do some <laughs> Well, you know, everyone has power steering. The modern day seat, you know, uh, guys are uh, like Randy of the Joy. They're building them now, and they're, they're really great. I used to all use all his seats. But I, I came down and built that seat that came around your shoulders first because I got tired of breaking my ribs mm. and uh, suspension things, uh, rear anti-roll bar you know they try to get that outlawed, they didn't get that outlawed DW said about the steering to Bill France Billy, he called France Billy too you can tell they're a real good friend Billy, if that power steering goes out that boy's going to wreck everybody, you can't let people run it, but eventually he had it and so, so all, those things, all those things to me are more important than the race wins I've had. Yeah. And, and for the races that are watching, uh, you know, you're 110% right, obviously. I'm way younger than you. We would go to Winchester, Indiana and in ASA. You know, you'd have to run five positive in the right front, and then you'd have to run one and a half negative in the left front. You let go of the wheel. Car just turned to the left by itself. Yeah. yeah. It, it, well, like you said, once you started bringing positive back in the left front, you know, going back, it, it, the car, the left front would get in the ground and work harder. Yeah. And, and you're Actually, right. I, I, won, I won races with Alpar here. I won Darlington and Frank Plessinger's uh, late mop. And that's the race that got me the cup ride with I'll be uh, darned. Cliff Stewart. But I beat, and that, I started right behind David Pearson. I followed him. I said, I'm going to, this guy's going to show me how to win this race and run the track. He, he was the best there at Darlington. Yeah. But, but Earnhardt's were in it. Allison's were in it. Uh, Harry Gant was in it. And David Pearson, I beat them all. And a day later, Cliff Stewart called me up. Hey, if you can, he had a big cigar in your mouth. Hey, if you weren't at Darlington, you can win anywhere. Come on down. <laughs> That's how I got my cup ride. That, that is that so badass. Without, let's, steering, without power steering. Let, let's go back to this. Uh, we, we glossed over the Bodine bobsled 
too much. Let me let me just say this. Let me give some stats. Um, the Winter Olympics, Salt Lake City, Utah, three medals in two thousand two. The girls but won they, a gold medal. The girls. The won girls a won a gold medal. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Two thousand ten, the granddaddy of them all, baby. Vancouver, British Columbia, gold medal. Thank, thank you, Jeff Bodine. For, you know, from one American to you, thank you, because you personally are responsible. But what I want to know, did the U.S. government, you know, did the president, did anybody, the vice president, did anybody call you and thank you for putting America on top? Zero. That's horrible. Yeah, yeah zero. You know, we didn't sell them to anybody. We, we build and maintain them all free. And uh, uh, actually, when I got involved, the, the board, the you know, Van Ridge are not just the board of directors for the project for the bobsledding. They tried to get rid of me because they used to go to Europe just to talk about bobsledding. They used to go here on trips, and, and here here's this guy that's coming in. He doesn't want anything. He just going to build sleds. He's paying for it. They tried to get me out, but the heart. I'm a hard the Yankee, so the more resistance we got from them, the more determined we were to get make this project work. But no, you know, I didn't do it for anything else than just to su uh, supply American-made fast bobsleds for a kid. I didn't, you know, in the Bible, God wants you to be humble. I'm humble. I didn't do it for me. I didn't even go to the, the races. They made me go to Salt Lake City, my, my board, and to Vancouver. I wasn't going to go because I didn't do it for that. But so... Uh, yeah, you know, I'm proud of it, and that made me a little disappointed that the president called me up and say at least yeah. say thanks, but didn't do it for any of that. And, and to this oh. day, and, I, and I'm going to be a little tough right now. Uh, this is me saying this. To this day, we buy so many items, you know, from other countries, and here to hear – from you, and, and it's you know it's all the record books. We were buying our bobsleds from other countries. Well, they're not going to let us win. So um, once again, from from me to you, Jeff, thank you for for doing what you did. Um, well, and man, look at you now. You're uh, you living down in Florida? Yeah, Lori and I live in Malabar, Florida. It's a little piece of heaven. It's it's be, between the Real crowded southern part of Florida and the real crowded Daytona Beach area, and just a piece of heaven. So what what are you up to now? Oh, yeah, can't get away away from racing. I help uh, a friend; he owns Ace Hardware in Malabar, uh, Melbourne. Uh, race at New Smyrna. I build a car, maintain it, and set it up. We've been doing that with George for uh, five or six years now. But then I met a gentleman here in Melbourne. Uh, that he liked to race the road courses. He had a car, and I just started helping him with it <clears throat> every day. And Lori, my wife, said, you know, James should be paying you. You're there every day working on a car. Well, <laughs> I mentioned that to James and said, yeah, my wife just told me I should be paying you too. So uh, he did a little bit. But we're in the, – there's a spec Corvette class in road racing right now. Very and, cool. Uh, we build Corvettes for that, and you know most people don't want to have a race car. A lot of maintenance, a lot of work, you know, all that stuff. So they rent them from us to mm. drive. And yeah. the summer buying us, we, we built really fast cars. So now people are wanting to buy a car from us. So we're busy. There's days I work ten hours a day. Yeah, awesome. Seventy five year old me, ten hours a day, but I love the business doing it. Yeah, that's what I've done all my life to build cars. Well, you know. I know you know because you're smarter and wiser than me, but I've just gone through this at 60. I was going to quit racing. And then Clint Eastwood said, don't let the old man in. Yeah. Because if we don't stay busy, we bind up. And and Jeff yeah. Bodine, you have a you have a lot of talent to give to people. Well, you know, yeah, if you sit down, you're gonna die. You know, I've got to have a bad back. They've yeah. been in my heart four times, and they put a little watchman in there because I had a fib. Gotcha. Just was up in my carotid artery. They thought it might be plugged, and so thank God that 
wasn't the case. So I'm all right here. Uh, my legs don't work quite right because of my back. Uh, yeah. I get injections in my back for the pain, which cortisone. Really, yeah, a lot of arthritis back in there. They take X-rays and pictures of back. It looks like a a, a bridge that fallen down. It's pretty. Looks healthy. like you used to run in NASCAR back in the day. <laughs> uh, you know, I've hit my head a lot. Had a lot of concussions, so I don't I don't drive anymore because uh, the next one might be the last one. I love yeah. my wife. I love my family. I got grandkids, a great granddaughter. So a lot more to do in life. So I stay out of the seats, but I just love working on it. Well, Jeff, let's, let's end it like this. Um, you're an Olympic gold medal bobsled uh, designer, owner. You've won the Daytona 500. You've still got Guinness Book of World Record, 55 wins in the Northeast. You helped bring the full face helmet to NASCAR. You are a safety innovator. Uh, I want to thank you for coming on the Kenny conversation with the Daytona 500 coming up, you know, this weekend, our, our great American race. And, and, buddy, you did it. You won it. Do you get sentimental? Do you ever think when the 500, you're like, man, I kicked their butt back in the day? <laughs> No, no, I, I, because I know I'm just blessed. I'm a blessed guy. Uh, you know, uh, the Lord's is giving yeah. me all this, all these opportunities. Like I said, I just used to shovel chicken manure, milk yep. cows, work at a racetrack, pick the rocks, drive the tractors and the water trucks and, uh, and dreamed about going to Daytona to win. That was a big enough dream. That was a big enough dream. Yeah. Then I, you know, as you mentioned, fortunately enough to do quite a few really neat things in NASCAR and racing. But you know, the strangest thing that I never dreamed would happen to me, not in a million years to write a book that yeah. people, people want. Yeah. I never, never came to my, I'm a farm kid from Shumong, New York. It's wild enough that I won a Daytona 500, but to write a book is crazy. And, you know, my wife's holding up a sign, and you can get this book, uh, and the only way you can get it autographed is through an autograph session with me. You know, but you can get it on Amazon or, or uh, Barnes & Noble. But to get this book, just go on Team Bodine, yeah, teambodine.square.site. You know, put you right to the link, click on it, and you can, you'll see this book. You'll also see the, the bobsled book. We wrote that. Uh, a few years ago, I didn't, another fellow did, but we still have a few of them left. Tells the whole bobsled story, and you can get one or both. You can buy 10 of these or one, it doesn't matter. It's all a pretty neat deal. But teambowline.square.site. Uh, we'll awesome. You and you get it autographed. Well, listen up, everybody. Kenny Conversation, the Kenny Wallace Show, Coffee with Kenny. We are in podcast form. You can find us on iTunes. Spotify, listen to the great Jeff Bodine on your way to work. And it's an hour long. So when you come back home, you can listen to the rest of it. Until next time, uh, Jeff Bodine, thank you so much. You going to be in Daytona? Nope, I'm not going to be there. I've been, I've been gone for 16 days. I just got done winning my Gator down there last week uh, at the Volusia. I miss my wife. I miss my grandbabies. I'm back in St. Louis, but I will watch the Daytona 500 on TV. Of course. Well, you know, you, you praise on me all day, but you know, folks, Kenny is incredible. He's still racing, still winning yep. at 60 years old, loves the sport, loves the race fans. There's no question about that. So yeah. we want to thank you for having me on the show and this opportunity to tell a few stories. They're great. Promote They're the good. And uh, we'll see you around somewhere. All right, everybody. Until next time, Kenny Conversation just keeps on rolling. Goodbye, everyone.